take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Welcome to Life in Rabbit. I think I told you this before when I was on your podcast that you have the sexiest voice in podcasting. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't I don't think it's the sexiest voice, but thank you. I do appreciate you saying that. Do you, do you like <laughs> the levels are off the charts with that bass? I love it. It's you know what when I edit my own podcast, sometimes I have to uh turn down the bass for my own voice because <laughs> it's too much. But uh well, thank you. I do appreciate that you say that. I I think my voice personally is somewhat annoying it sounds too robotic <laughs> i think everybody thinks that every time i hear my voice i'm like no nah, that that can't be me that that's not me that's definitely not me and then i'm like oh shit it is me and then i start hearing it but you like my voice is like tangy and like i don't know it's chickeny yours is like just like a smooth jazz <laughs> And that's what I appreciate. Well, no, your voice, you have a lot of passion in your voice. My voice, the moment I realized that, oh, maybe I sound like a robot is when I was working, I answered the, or I answered the phone and I did my little introduction and the person just hung up, called back and said, yes, a robot answered the phone. And that was my colleague that answered. like, no, no, that's Alex. So I'm like, oh, wow. I got to work on how I deliver so I don't sound too artificial. Like when I try to do a presentation, it sounds too cheesy. Like. The yeah, like I don't like, and don't take this the rude way. I'll take but, it the rude way. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it comes across like you're uh, like you're broad. Um, yeah, like you're broadcasting it. Like uh, like everything's very kind of like rehearsed in a way. Yeah, but yeah. like it's very deep and it's just it's. I I think it's great. It's like I'm saying something really important. Cheese yeah. in chairs are very part of word sentence. I can't even see. Have you ever thought about getting into <laughs> voice acting? You know what? I would actually be interested in doing that. I, if there's an opportunity, yeah, sure. Or why like, not? Uh, like voice imaging and stuff. Like I know working in radio, like we have our what we call our big voices, which is like the imaging, basically the people that like, this is the home of rock, like bro, one oh two two, like like this like, is the home of rock, one oh point two. Yeah, exactly. Right, and then <laughs> they like one of the guys we have lives in Beverly Hills. Really? Like, so he makes a lot of money. So. Well, you know what? I, I'm always down to try new things. And if my voice is suitable for anybody who might be like, you know what? I want Alex's voice for this. Hey, I'm open to try new things. So speaking of Alex, you are the host of uh, a fellow podcast in town. And that's how kind of we connected through the podcast community. I'll let you say what it is just and so I don't butcher it because I always do butcher things. You can never butcher it. It's our connection and you were on the podcast so. that's right episode i, I saw you <laughs> 56. On 56 yeah i'm really bad at remembering the exact episode numbers for episodes but yes i have a podcast called time for your hobby and it's a podcast where i interview people from all walks of life from around the world about their hobbies so it can be a big hobby let's say skydiving i haven't done that yet but it could also be small hobbies like walking anything that you do during your free time is a hobby and you are more than welcome to come on and talk about it and ryan was very energetic. He approached me and then we just started talking and he said, I want to be on your podcast. I'm like, cool. I want you on. And his episode was about mental health and he's a mental health advocate and speaker. Well, you know what? People who are listening to this might People already know, know this. About me. This is about Alex. <laughs> yeah, and, I feel like I'm trying to do. host this, but this is your podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, this is the thing, right? When you get on the other side of the microphone and you're like, oh wait, no, 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 no. Uh, so, I mean, why'd you get into... I think on my, our podcast, and I've talked about it on mine, like why I got into to mine, but like what made you want to start your own podcast? Why like hobbies? Uh, so to answer the first question, how I got into it is that my wife used to work night shifts and we had different days off. So most of the time I would come home and I would have no one to talk to and I would just wait there, cook dinner and stuff like that. And I just felt bored and unproductive. And I decided, well, why not find a new hobby? And I hung out with some friends and they said, oh, we're starting a podcast. And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I have the equipment because I used to be a producer and I used to rap and write music. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> we're timing out there for a second. Yeah, you yeah. used to rap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get back into that. I'm going to let you, <laughs> I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna let you finish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to get into that because that was not on the pre notes. It's, it's a little hidden gem. I was saving oh it for God. later. Okay. Okay. You, Continue. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, but I'm writing that down. Yeah, notes. write it down on your post-it note. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so my friends were saying, "Oh yeah, I, I'm, we're starting a podcast," and I said, "You know what? 
I want to start one too because I had the equipment and I am very familiar with recording and editing and I've always enjoyed editing. But I've always tried to f- struggle. I wanted to do radio and I wanted to do like broadcasting, but I never knew what kind of show I wanted to do. And literally just one day it just dawned upon me like hobbies. Oh, cool. Because I wanted to make something that was helpful, like your podcast, like something that can help people out. And I'm like, well, people don't want to hear about my hobbies. Why not interview people about their hobbies? Because they're the experts. And of course, I started off by interviewing friends and family because that's the easiest thing to do. And uh, from there, I had probably 18 episodes or 19 episodes of friends and families. And then I started branching out and getting people from all around the world to, let's say, Scotland, South Korea. Um, I have friends from Rwanda, just everywhere sharing their hobby. And I found it cool that you can learn about other people's hobbies. Like, let's say my friend who is from Rwanda, his hobby is watching sports anime. And it was a Konosuba, which is a sport anime about soccer. But the idea that they shared a similar hobby that I did as a kid, but it's in another country, which was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those cultural... You think that, like, yeah, cult, there's, like, a big cultural divide in, in, you know, where you are geographically in the world and how you're brought up and, and you know, your family and religion and all that type of stuff. But really, when it comes down to it, a lot of us do the exact same things no matter where we are. I, was, I find that fascinating, too. Exactly. And that is why, also, one of my big objectives with my podcast is to try to get rid of misconceptions and why it makes people happy. Because... At the end of the day, we're all looking for happiness and we're all very similar in what we try to achieve in life. And getting rid of misconceptions can actually open up the door for people to learn new things and picking up a new hobby. And also, I think it's very important for when you get older to have a hobby Mm -hmm. because you have some people who are very, very focused on work, work, work. And when it comes to retirement, they struggle to try to find something to do in the meantime so even if you pick up a hobby for a few weeks when you're younger you can try it again when you're older but that idea to keep your mind active and keep yourself busy is very important to me and i feel like if i have this opportunity to share other people's hobbies on my podcast i have to do it it's my goal in life interesting okay fair enough (laughs) now the rap career yeah (laughs) i want to know about this okay so i'm a huge hip-hop fan uh, I wouldn't say I'm like a diehard, but like old school '90s hip hop. Yep, yeah, like that. I just uh, have you seen Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix? I've seen parts of it actually. Yeah, no, go watch it all <laughs> tonight. It's so good. Oh, like just the the history in it and the the beef and the cultural impacts. It's like it's so good. I just respect the hell out of it. Like at one time, I would always just watch a bunch of YouTube videos about like how lyrics are built, and uh, yeah, I think Vox had one about how uh, Biggie Smalls and Nas and uh, Most Def how they build their lyrics, and I just found that so fascinating. Yeah. So there we go, another thing we can connect on. Yeah, there you go. Uh, okay, <laughs> how long did you did you try to pursue this seriously, or was it like just like something you fucked around with? Uh, so I started you know, hip hop back. I think it was in. 10th grade in my high school so my high school had a big love for hip-hop and i was part of a group that a guy started creating beats and he was a rapper as well and he made a few songs for me and they're still up on youtube i still have my channel oh my <laughs> god oh my god keep i'll talking. share it i'll share it i'll no, share keep it. talking right now uh so uh yes uh you, you the, the channel is called soul logical music on YouTube. Was that Just, your rapper? Like, so logical? My name, yeah, I went through a different types of names, but it sounds egotistical when you say so logical music. But so, yeah, I started back in 2010. I'm going off track and I started a song. My first song was called 100%. It was cheesy, but I left it up there and it just went on for a few years. And then at one point, I'm like, you know what? I love this. I love making hip hop. I love writing rap and lyrics, but I want to try to make my own instrumentals because. He, he made amazing instrumentals, but I also wanted to give it a shot because I had sounds in my head that I wanted to do. I can see Ryan trying to look for it. It's soul, soul logical music, all one word. And okay. then so I started uh, producing my own instrumentals as well. And I can't read or yeah, he sees me. Oh, my goodness. There I am. Uh, so, yeah, I started producing my own instrumentals and I can't play piano. I can't read music. So it was me just doing one key at a time. 
Oh, so this one right here, uh, Ryan's playing, is... Oh, no, it's not up here yet. Okay. <laughs> That's you? That's me without the beard. Oh. This is... Uh, so th- it's a university. This is okay. when I was in okay. University okay. of Ottawa. Okay, we're going we're gonna to... I made the beat as well. <laughs> you might have to restart because I'm pretty proud of that beat. That was, that was good. Once again, I couldn't read music or play the piano, so it took me sometimes hours and hours and hours like to create an instrumental. And my style is a lot like the 90s hip-hop or more like the epic music. I want you to feel like, oh, you're on top of the world right, when you're listening right. to this. And I throw my own little twist to it. And my lyrics as well have that like get into your soul kind of uh, lyrics and uh, I've been doing that for since I was 16 I'm 27 now so over 10 years <laughs> do you still do it um I've taken a break uh in producing music uh, right. because I've been podcasting. focusing on podcasting because yeah, yeah, it takes yeah. a lot of my time but um I don't doubt I'll go back to it because I love playing the piano I love I can't play I love fiddling around and creating melodies and out of like, let's say every one instrumental or song I make, I've probably produced 50 to 75 instrumentals that are just there. Like sometimes I just like fiddle around. I'm like, oh, I create a scrap song. Mm, don't use it. Or I come back to it. But it's just the idea like, get that creativity out of your head. Boom, there, mm. I move on. Why not do a podcast on hip hop or something then? Was that not something that you thought about? Uh, like for me personally, mm-hmm. talking about hip hop? Well, you know, like if you're... You, a young MC or a rapper, maybe he's trying to start a career, getting connected with the scene. You know, if you thought about starting a podcast, you said that this kind of came to you. Was like not doing one on hip hop, maybe like an original idea or something like that. Um, well, you know what? For hip hop, actually, hip hop itself, I've always seen it as just a hobby. I've always wanted okay. it to be like a stress reliever right, for right, when right. I, let's say, had a long day. You could have said that, and I apologize because <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I no. need to see the rap video. <laughs> no, no, no. By all means, I don't care about sharing it. It's yeah, part yeah, of my yeah. journey. It's part That's of how cool. I got here today, and that is why I also produced for a lot of people as well, and I never charged them. I always did it for free because for the love of hip hop, that was my idea and the idea that I didn't want to charge because the moment I said, okay, this is how much I want to charge it for. They're going to probably expect a deadline on when to have it. And since I was a student in university at the time, I decided I didn't want to put that in front of my studies because during the first year I did for a little bit Mm -hmm. and it affected my grades. And that's when I had a snack back to reality right. and realize okay probably should focus on my studies but yeah i've always loved producing for a lot of uh, other people making some songs and it's always been a passion of mine okay wait i'm gonna try this again i gotta turn i gotta do turn off the mics and then we're gonna try this again here you guys want anything oh yeah um, is this a good university if you listen to this and I intrigued your mind, you won't find a university that's better than mine. Jump on my GG, proud and I know it. And everywhere I go, I need to show it. More than an image, so I must elaborate. Top 20 schools, so don't need to debate. It's an easy choice that you won't regret. Feed your intellect when you get the lessons that you won't forget. Officially bilingual, learn in French or in English. Whichever one you take, you have the tools to accomplish your dreams. Oh my god, I'm freaking out. <laughs> that is amazing. Oh, I couldn't hear it the first time. Now I went through it. That's it's, sick. That's actually thanks, really man. great. So yeah, I was I not a... expecting that. Sometimes you know when like someone tells you like, oh yeah, I do this. You know, like, okay, and you come on, you're like, mm, yeah, like that's <laughs> great job. But like, oh, that was cool. Yeah, no. Uh, so this like it was, like I said, it was a hobby, and there's a bunch of like you could see this evolution. Like that's oh god. You got what if here? You got what if is an old okay. one? If you want to listen to a good one, uh, listen to this is it. That one I'm very proud of. It's probably one of my newer ones. If you go up the other way, uh, just go to my channel. It might oh be easier. Goodness. Yes. <laughs> I have also recorded a song with my wife, and I uploaded there, too. Uh, this is it. Should probably be. There ago. it is. With the one at the bottom left with a hat. Bottom left. There this it is. is it? This is it. Okay, here we're going to try this. Again. Oh, yes. Oh, get the cringiness out. <laughs> good morning, oh, good there. afternoon, or good evening. Whichever one you want to use, you're more than welcome to use it. I'm so logical, and today I will be showing you a new song that I just did called This Is It. Now, I know I'm not too creative with the Let's title of the here. song, yeah, but yeah. the creativity is put within all this. And yes, I know I'm wearing this little straw hat. My 
go, I'm far from done. Not stopping here, admit it crystal clear. By the time I'm done, I'm facing my fear. Living to the fullest with friends by my side. When I try my best, I'll be satisfied. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, nope, I didn't. Yes, I had a dream and I will fulfill it. Off to space, no skies are the limit. Mine is a shuttle, so no time for the gimmick. You can come along if you're willing to follow. Keep an open mind. Totally. <laughs> Digging that. I just gave it a like, too, on it. Oh, thank you, man. So, yeah, I came up with the name So Logical because it's not necessarily me. It's about my music being so logical. So it sounds originally logical because I tend to follow the beat. So that's mm -hmm. how I came up with the name. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much, man. All right. We're going to give you a little plug there. That's cool. I didn't expect that. That, that just made me really excited. <laughs> we just did that live. Uh, now the whole world knows more about me personally oh, and my music. That's good. Uh, I've actually, I don't think I've ever mentioned it on my own podcast, but I guess now I have to if uh, people want to learn more about me. That's, that's the thing, man. That's cool. Like, uh, are you going to go? <laughs> I know you're doing the whole podcast thing now. Like, are you going to get back into that? Like, it's just kind of you, you come and go and you, you, you see where life takes you. Uh, but like, I guess for now, I want this still to be just a hobby. Like if I'm having a long day, get back to it just to fiddle, fiddle around with the piano and create a melody. Um, I never wanted to do anything big with uh, my music because I've always wanted, like I said before, to be a stress reliever. And I've had opportunities. I know it sounds egotistical saying that, but I've had opportunities where I, like a studio is like, oh, or a uh, record deal is like, oh, we want your instrumentals. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm good. I know it sounds egotistical saying wow. I'm like I'm too good for you. I, no, it's not that. It's just I did, in the back of my mind I'm like I don't want this to be something that I get stressed over because I know <clears throat> well until now I have podcasting, but th then when I did it, I didn't have anything else to go back on if mm. I had a stressful day. So I'm like, you know what? I want to keep this my thing for when I relax. Yeah, I've I've heard that I, that sediment right there that that's not necessarily uncommon. Um I've heard people who are like really good at hockey or really good at a sport or really good at, um, you know, anything that they, they don't want to turn that into something that would then put pressure on it. You know, whether that becomes your, your income or it's, it, it takes a lot out of your life. It, uh, I've heard that before. So I, I don't think it's very uncommon. <laughs> I don't know what that was. That was the that computer was getting genes. angry at us. Yeah, no problem. Well, there's one quote that I remember from Harold and Kumar, Go to the White Castle, or I, I forget the title, but it's yeah. Harold and Kumar, where, sorry for the listeners, but it's like, just because you have a big dick doesn't mean you need to do porn. Kind of <sighs> thing. <laughs> in other words, uh, just because you're really talented in, let's say, doing something doesn't mean you have to go professional. You can keep it for yourself. Well, right, right. Keeping your dick for yourself, That's I guess. That's true. <laughs> kind of a weird analogy, but yes. Yeah, no, I... I it's funny though in the in the world that we live in today that you're in in totally encouraged in everything you do to not only you know chase after your dream but try to monetize all of your skills like that's what we're you know from the the day time we wake up to the time we go to bed that everything you should be doing is about making money and trying to maximize everything you can for profit. Um, and like, you know, like to get a job, to get, get a girlfriend or a, a boyfriend or, or whatever, like you're supposed to use all the, the tools in your toolbox to try to do that. So it's interesting that you have this thing in your back <laughs> pocket and you choose not to kind of go against conventional wisdom and try to, you know, and just keep it as something you just enjoy to do, whether, you know, to, to de-stress mental health, whatever that that's, in, it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting, interesting take. Yeah. Well, in a way, I do use it to my advantage where, let's say if uh, I'm theoretically speaking, I look for another job and they want to know what are my people skills. Well, I would say, well, I have a podcast where I interview people. So I use that as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would introduce my ability to communicate with people or music. Let's say, oh, I'm going into a creative area. Oh, well, I've created music. So it's I use it. My, I use my hobbies as a stepping stone. I don't want to necessarily go pursue my hobbies i sound so lame saying that mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. maybe you know what this is me saying this now maybe 10 years from now maybe even tomorrow i have an epiphany and i'm like you know what screw it i'm gonna go into podcasting full time yeah and you never know what's gonna happen right i change my mind every like month <laughs> i'm like today i want to do this and then i wake up i'm like ah no it's i'm gonna do this now and I can't make up my mind what I want to do. <laughs> that, that happens to me sometimes, like when I'm choosing a pair of socks. And I'm not, sometimes I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to wear one from each. 
Oh no, that's <laughs> don't do that ever. Um, we just uh, we just finished up an election as the time we record this in in Canada, and I'm interested. Um, are you are you a political guy at all? Um, do you follow? Do you pay attention? Do you have uh, strong opinions either way or the other? You know what? I'm not extremely political, but I do have a strong opinion. That sounds weird saying that. Interesting, okay. <laughs> the reason why I have a strong opinion is not necessarily the politics itself, but the effects of politics, what it does on people. Mm, okay. In other words, I'm kind of disappointed that people, a lot of people during election times or just in general, only see each other as either conservative or liberal or let's say in the states uh republican or democrat like that's the only thing you mm-hmm. are you're it's only either black or white and unfortunately people do not take the time to try and understand the other side and that's what really disappoints me because we're in 2019 but it doesn't matter what year we're in but we're in a day and age where we have the ability to learn more about people but we stay focused on our own beliefs mm-hmm. our own morals our own uh beliefs i guess that's the best word that we don't necessarily take the time anymore to try to learn what the other side other side has to offer so uh that's my big impact and what i really dislike about politics uh let's say during elect election season is the slander that when they try to attack to attack each other it's like oh well this person did this and this person did this I'm like okay cool that's why why are you attacking each other instead of attacking each other why not present what you have to offer and if you're better than the other pe- other person then we'll see that don't have to slander it's like when you're having an argument on the internet where people start start off having a logical debate and then it goes off where one person starts correcting the grammar of the other person and then they start fighting about grammatical correction mm-hmm. and they're like okay well mm-hmm. you guys are arguing about something completely different now yeah, I, I've talked about this in numerous. I think we talked about this on on the episode I did with you too, and the the effects that all this has. Uh, it really starts to come down to uh, like a, a, a form of tribalism, just like in sports, right? Like you like that team, I like this team. You're an idiot for liking that team. You know, you 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 set yourself with your ideals and and your and your virtues and your morals on what kind of you separate on the other team. And then you act, a lot of people at least do that, no matter what your team does, right or wrong, like, you, you double down on it because that's your team. You, you're always going to try to win. And that's also what happens. You become that, you're just trying to win. It's not about compromise or, or, or hearing the other person out. It, uh, it, it just becomes about winning. Who's winning? Who's smarter? What's the right way and what's the wrong way? Um, and I think that's what... You definitely see more and more, and especially since you know when Trump was elected, that that really kind of magnified that that team sense. At least in my mind, like that's where I really. It, it could have been that I'm getting older, could have been you know social media became more prevalent. But to me, like that's when all of a sudden things really changed and quite dramatically. Um, so I find that interesting uh, that you you also kind of share that and what I. I paid a lot of close attention this election because on one hand, I I look at it that, you know, hearing both sides of the argument, the the conservative fiscal responsibility and, you know, social justice on the left, trying to pay really close attention to what they're saying and understand why they don't like the other side instead of understanding why they like their own side, why they don't like the other side of the argument. And what I found, at least in my opinion, while I was examining it, that people on the left really didn't like people on the right voting for conservative (laughs) uh, because they felt that by voting conservative and voting for sheer, that you would be putting people into harm. Um, You know, people of color, LGBT, those were very strong. Uh, indigenous people, um, those were very strong worries that came up during this election of what the policies of the conservative government, taking all things aside away from economics, and we're just talking about social, really, but they felt that by voting conservative, you would be doing a lot of harm to those types of people. So I was really trying to under understand that because I am a big believer in hearing on both sides, but also trying to to listen to that and say, okay, you're kind of right. Like, you know, I, I, you can't say for certain, but if you have that worry, then absolutely you're justified in, 
and having that concern. I don't know. Um, so I found that really interesting, at least in the post kind of examination I did of this election and after, you know, Sheer wasn't elected and we, we got four more years maybe of Trudeau. Um, I found that interesting. I don't know. It's uh, And I don't know what to think of it and what to make of that and where the future goes in, in, in future elections and future debates of, of that because that doesn't seem easily solved because – not all, you know, liberals won the most seats. The majority of candidates did not vote for Sheer, but if you're looking by party, conservatives won the popular vote. So, more than fifty percent, or I guess it's three ways. The majority of Canadians settled on voting conservative, so they obviously hold some of these beliefs. And how do you change that? That like to me, I'm like, that's a really interesting future. And you know what? I feel like uh, also some people have a hard time grasping that it's okay to vote for another party if you find it acceptable. You don't always have to vote for, let's say, liberals because your ex-spouse is voting for conservatives or vice versa. You could oh, you could change. It's nature. You're human. You could change votes. If you support the conservatives for a certain reason, then, yeah, go for it. Yeah. If you support the liberals, the NDP, Bloc Québécois, or anybody else, go for it. There's nothing wrong. It's your right to go vote, and you shouldn't be judged necessarily on just exercising your right just because it supports your belief and what you believe in. That's that's what I believe. I, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I do strongly think that history will repeat itself, and that's the fault of humanity. We keep on creating the same mistakes over and over again. And this doesn't change when it comes to politics as well. It's going to be just a circle of things. Like we go through recessions like, oh, okay, okay, here we go, here we go. And it's ups and downs. Well, it's four, it's eight years of conservative, eight years of liberal. And you just go through the cycle really of going right, going left. But what I was trying to say, I guess, like the core of what I was trying to get at is People on the on the left felt that it was unethical to vote right mm. for conservative because by supporting that government and supporting Andrew Scheer, you are basically condemning groups of people in this country that you would not be supporting them and you would be allowing them to be oppressed and taken advantage of and dehumanized in ways. And that's where I was like, hmm. Like you know, I wasn't a, a fan of Sheer, and I I thought mm-hmm. he he ran a very uh, regressive, you know, campaign. Where sure you didn't go out and say that you're gonna you know you use you won't re- open the de- abortion debate. You won't um, re- reopen legalizing you know or uh, gay marriage, but you also said you didn't support it. But you wouldn't reopen it. Now, that is saying basically to them and from what I've read and even a little bit to me that like that's basically saying like you don't support them by base by not say, like I'm not saying I don't support you, but I don't support you. Uh, yeah, like. <laughs> exactly. Right. And it's to me, that's where it got interesting. Like how how are we ever going to find a resolution where, you know, I think a lot of people who voted right voted on it fiscally that they just want a balanced budget and they don't want to run a deficit and they don't want high taxes. I think that's the core of what a lot of them, obviously you have racist people and, you know, xenophobic and anti-Semitic and all that stuff that, that vote right and stuff. But I don't think they go in it with a bad heart, but they're being grouped in with people with a bad heart because of, you know, you get, all painted with the same brush just because you vote for that. And that comes down to our political system where we have to vote not based on everyone who represents our values on just what best represents our values. You know, exactly. I don't agree yeah. with everything NDP say. I don't agree with any, what any exactly. of them say. Yeah. All, not all of it. Some of it I do on every side that I'm like, okay, yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, they good all point. offer something different. What's going to be the best for me and what's going to support my values the best. And unfortunately, a lot of people vote on this fiscal responsibility that also comes with a kind of a social, a social aspect to it, which is not good. And where's that balance? And are people going to balance it? And I 
I mean, I don't know. Where I come from, everyone's conservative. I always say they could Mm. run a bag of dog shit (laughs) as the MP and it would still win. Like, that's just where we come. It's just, it's, it's a small town. It's conservative. We'll always be conservative no matter what. And I can't see that changing and that's not going to make a lot of people happy and feel safe. And I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm like, I don't know. I just, I, I, I look at it, but like, I, there's no easy fixes there. No, there isn't. And, uh, we, we tend to react once the consequences happen. We don't, uh, well, that's stupid to me as saying that, but in other words, we vote, we do, we do the actions, and then we react like, okay, now we want change. It happened with Stephen Harper, happened with Justin Trudeau. Uh, it just happens with everybody. And I'm, I'm sad to say, like, I have a, I have a friend who supports Trump. Mm. I'm not Ooh, a big fan. I'm yeah, not a big fan of fr- Trump. Um, that's a toughie. Yeah, I'm not that's gonna reveal, but we still connect on other things, and he's a really good old friend. And sure, sometimes we have political debates that don't go smoothly, but we understand at the end of the day, like, oh, we're both like friends. We're both looking for mm-hmm. happiness and we shouldn't be judging each other based off of our political choices. Yeah. I think that's where it gets complicated now because, you know, with, with Trump and by no means am I saying, you know, your friend's a bad person or anything. I don't know them, but oh, the worst, the yeah. worst. <laughs> but when you support a, a man like Trump as president and some of his policies, you know, um, what he did with Turkey and Syria, um, locking up people in detention centers at the border of Mexico. I mean, that's a, a big, big one that, you know, to me, how, how do you support someone like that? But also does, I guess the thing is by supporting a government that, that does that, does that make you a bad person in return? Mm. And I guess I could, not that I'm comparing the two, but if you took a look back at, you know, would you support Hitler just because he made Germany great, even though he did all these great things? Does that make that person a bad person for supporting Hitler? Like, I don't know. It's a, it's, it's an interesting time we're moving into where yeah. these things are coming much more into play. That the government you support, people want that to define everything about you. But and, it can't. Yeah, I, I do tend to agree. I guess I'm just playing devil's advocate. No, by it. all means, that's, um, this, these types of conversations are needed. Yeah, just exactly. To get the, um, the message out there. It, uh, that's kind of, but that's what's happening. People want the party you vote for, or the ide- the the sexual identity you identify as, or or the the gender or the advocacy thing that you advocate for. That is turning into more and more like an identity for yourself right and like for instance for me i have to be very careful that my mental illness doesn't become who i am doesn't define everything i do that doesn't make every decision that i make because i don't want it to because i'm not only just you know have a mental illness i i really like hockey i have a podcast i work in radio there are so many different layers to everyone's character and what makes us who we are that like to me, I don't want to be defined by one thing or by who I vote for or that who I choose to love or who I choose to have sex with. Like all those things are part of me, but that's not just one part of me. I really believe that, you know, I can be, you could vote conservative, but donate a ton of money to a hospital, to helping kids build wells, to marching in pride and and funding you know women's shelters and trans organizations does that still make you a bad person just because you support trump but still do all these other things some people would say that it is some people say that it wouldn't and that's just where we get into this crazy time where we're just you know we're having a lot of people are saying a lot of stuff but no one's really listening and there's not really conversations happening it's just people throwing what they believe out out and hoping they beca- like they get reaffirmed in their beliefs that people are like great yeah i totally agree with you and and when anyone doesn't then that becomes a whole other thing and like i just i don't know where we're going and it it used to stress me out a lot more than it did like i had to start going to therapy yeah. because of the shit because it was getting on my mind so much uh but it it is still concerning to me that like you know the just 
you see it more and more every day. Well, that's why I agree with you. The idea of, let's say, you were talking about how just because you're this, this is how you have to be. Like me growing up, being half black, half white, mm. that was like a big thing. Like I had a, somewhat of an identity crisis when I was a kid, trying to figure out, do I belong to the black kids? Do I belong to the white kids? And it was just like, that's what it brought up. Like I, can't, I shouldn't be defining myself based off my ethnicity. That's in- it's interesting you bring that up because that's been conversations I've had with people before. Because, that again, that's another very touchy subject today in, in, in social media and in today's culture that, yeah, like black identity and, and what confirmed, like what is racism, what isn't racism, what is all that type of thing. I'm interested to hear more about that. Um, when have you found your identity yet? Like when did you kind of discover what you wanted to be? Um, you know, what is social media like with all that stuff, type of stuff too? Cause you said you don't want to define yourself by your ethnicity, mm-hmm. but a lot of people so, would argue uh, that. So my family is pretty multicultural. My di- so theoretically, actually speaking, I'm like half black, half white, but mostly pretty much multicultural. Like okay. I have multiple ethnicities in me and, um, growing up. So if you look at me, if people see me, I'm half black, half white, but I look more Arab or Latino. And I've been mistaken for Arabic or Latino many times. I've even had some occasions where people would come up to me and start speaking to me in Arabic. And I'm, I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't I, I don't speak Arabic. And one person is like, you're a disgrace. I'm like, what? Oh, Wait, damn. How, how am I? I can't. I, I'm, I'm not Arabic. I, I, I'm not a disgrace. <laughs> I'm sorry. But aside from him, does it bother you when people misidentify you as, as like a... A, a you can say race? I'm, I'm a very open. You can say whatever you want. Um, no, at this point, it really doesn't. You know why? Because I spent so much time growing up trying to figure out my identity. Like, oh, to the black kids, I'm white. To the white kids, I'm black. Oh, uh, I don't I've, fit in. Mm. So I'm like, oh, well, screw it. Screw it. I'm just going to be me. Like people nowadays still think, oh, I'm Arabic or Latino or um, I'm not black. I'm not white. I'm like, you know what? I'm whatever you want me to be. Because you know why that's not important to me right now is because I'd rather you focus on me as a personality, as a person, rather than my skin. My skin is skin deep. You turn off the lights, you touch my skin, you can't tell what color I am. Mm-hmm. And I, I noticed that I will be judged my entire life. Like when I go to airports, I am ch- randomly checked is every it time. Really? Every it's time. It's that bad, eh? But it's whether I have the beard or not, I am randomly checked. I remember this one time I went with my wife and the guy's like calls us over and my wife's like, oh, yep, yeah, that's me. My wife is a short Korean woman. <laughs> She's like, yep, it's me. And he's like, no, no, you. I'm like, yeah, I know. My sister, she gets pat- gets her afro patted down. Really? Eh? For uh, w- uh, weapons, quote unquote. But I actually set off the metal detector wearing sweatpants and sh- uh, a t-shirt. But yeah, to answer your question, it doesn't really bother me because it's a momentary thing. And I'd rather let the person know the person behind the skin. Like mm-hmm. if they go off and saying, Oh, you're half black. That means you must be like this. And, and if I go get angry at them, then I'm just perpetuating this anger mm-hmm. and not less, letting him like, well, not letting him, but not teaching him anything. So let's say he comes to me, Oh, I'll have black people think they're whites and stuff like that. And I'd be like, well, just sit down and have a conversation with them. So the person gets to know me mm-hmm. indirectly by just knowing me as a person. And so next time he's thinking, oh, well, I met this half black, half white guy and he was actually delightful. Hopefully, I would hope that I'm delightful. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the idea that, okay, not everybody's like this. And like talking about, let's say Justin Trudeau doing the whole brown face, black face thing. So uh, to me, sure, it, it was disappointing but it's a momentary thing it was in the past he should have known better but we move on my grandmother she's from barbados she's black and she's she lived through like segregation and were white washrooms for for only white people and the colored washroom was colored but she didn't let that bring her down and now in our family my grandmother my father black my mother white my wife korean two half ki- uh, two half mixed kids my brother-in-law's russian so we really don't really care about where you're from, what you look like. Like, honestly, sometimes I'm like, oh, my wife's Korean. And my, my wife's like, oh, my husband is half black, half white. Oh, like we, we have that little moment like, oh, yeah. And then we forget about it and then we just go on through our day. That's in- very interesting. Cause, I mean, it's refreshing to hear you say that because when you look at social media, that that, that, that that doesn't seem to be the narrative that's being pushed mm-hmm. out right now. I like. I, 
couple questions for you on, on all Hit this, me. if you don't mind. I do not mind. Um, do you identify as like half black, half white, or do you identify as white or as as black or like? I know you're trying to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're your own person, and I, yeah. I respect that. Mm-hmm. But like, people again always want to kind of put you in a box. And it was interesting to hear you say, you know, black people say you're white, white people say you're black. Yeah. Like, so how do you like just describe yourself to people? Like, is it is it the whole yeah I'm half white half black type thing? So in elementary school, I I was more identified as white, and I thought I was like a little white kid. In high school, I identified as a black kid, and I just acted more like a black kid. Well, act I say acted, but. Just, I go with the stereotypes, of like acting as a white kid stereotype, acting as a mm-hmm. black kid. Like I did went to the extreme. And as I went through university, I, I guess the best way to identify myself would be probably multicultural. Yeah, okay. So I have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But some people have told me, oh, you have a black voice, but you, st- you speak like a white person. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but like. No, 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 no. You can laugh. It's yeah, kind yeah. of like. Uh, you know, like it kind of does sound like you know what they would have probably tried to make. I mean, probably still make this, other people do on day, TV, yeah. like you know the weather guy, or like oh, it's gonna be like blah, blah, blah. it's gonna be this, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So I've, and sometimes I sound like a black guy talking, and it's my voice. I I try not to change it. I, they, I trust me. This is my real voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not modified. Yeah. Ryan is not doing any magical tricks, and um, but yeah, it's. I really do identify as multicultural these days, mm-hmm. but I don't tend to focus on that. If And let's say people, they come up to me and they ask, because some people get really nervous, like, oh, I don't want to ask, but where are you from? Like, you know that question? And I'm like, guess. I'm actually pleased to like try to have people guess where I'm from because it, it creates a conversation. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. I want to create that conversation. Like sometimes I got Filipino once. I'm like, oh, cool. I got Filipino. <laughs> I, I don't know how, but you know what? Yeah. That's cool. Um, but yeah, like, cause I, so I'm fluently bilingual. French and English are technically my first languages. I speak French to my mother, English to my father. So when I speak French and I look like how I look, people think I'm Algerian or North or sorry, not North Moroccan, Moroccan. So uh, I like to play long. And yeah, if you, you're from around the world, basically. Basically, yeah. at this point, yeah. I have yeah. that face that looks like, oh, I could be this, I could be this. Great for uh, escaping a crime. I'm not a criminal, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. Um, Once again, not a criminal. Do you, do you feel any sort of outward pressure to conform in one way or the other, like that you have to subscribe to certain narratives that are, are being pushed um, that, you know, that you have to, you know, embrace quote unquote, your culture a little bit more in, in a certain, whichever way that leans, like, is, do you, like, if you go on social media or you, you watch the news or, or you, or you take part in, in, you know, kind of like the, the pop culture of our, our society, do you feel there's any sort of influence or pressure trying to pull you one way or the other into conforming into a certain, you know, um, narrative of of what you're supposed to be or who you're Uh, supposed to be when i was younger yes but nowadays no and i get kind of sad when both let's say black people white people asians anybody from any culture starts attacking another ethnicity just because of how they look and it disappoints me because let's say like they say white people are racist or black people can't be racist. And I'm like, well, that's not true. It, there's really good white people and there's really good b- black people. And it's just, unfortunately you only hear about the bad ones. The ones that are the loudest get, get the coverage and get a stronger, I say a stronger voice. Whoops. Almost fell in my chair. Oh, geez. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan just saw me just open my eyes really wide. Yeah, He's getting excited. <laughs> But yeah, I don't I don't feel that pressure nowadays. Um okay. I just for me, I don't care if people judge me for who I am. But where I do get offended is if people attack vulnerable people. Mm. That's where I feel like I have to step in. I don't like the idea of people getting attacked and they can't defend themselves and and they just keep getting attacked. I want to just be there if they need my help or just consent if they need help. I'm not saying physically in a fight. I I don't fight. Mm-hmm. I mean like if I see like a situation where somebody's being abusive to somebody else or my wife will says I am a hard headed person and I will end up getting myself killed by just in, trying to like meddle and try to protect people. And, uh, 
I feel like it's my duty to just yeah. be there if people need me. And no, I don't feel that narrative to fit in necessarily. Okay. You're just cool being your own person and everything. Yeah, like because that. at the end of the day, I will be constantly judged no matter what. How I look, my skin tone. I can't convince everybody. Very There's people that are going to hate me. That's that's a given. I can't. I, mm-hmm. Not everybody can love me. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot, a big thing in, in the election and, and, uh, uh, that was coming up and, you know, it's in America and it's a big topic of conversation is what, what is institutionalized racism. So how our society is based on, built on whiteness and, and, Mm. and, and power structure and all that type of stuff. Do you have experiences of, you know, being discriminated against? I know you talked about the airport, um, and being pulled aside, but like, getting jobs like being followed by police like any of those things you kind of you you hear about happening you know someone like me who has no experience or or clue about it like have you have you experienced that stuff in Canada because I know a lot of people still think that Canada is pretty clean Mm -hmm. of racism and which is clearly not the case but you know coming from someone who you know, might experience it and who's already said you have, mm-hmm. like, have, do you have like some stories of like, of, of stuff like that? Um, yeah, I've been followed a few times in stores uh, and, yeah, yeah. uh, when I was a kid, it bothered me more than it should. Um, I didn't, uh, there was some places that I had difficulty getting a job, like, especially when I was younger, like they had a sign outside said hiring. And then when I went in to try to send in my resume, like, no, no, we're not hiring. And then it goes like a pharmacy or something like that. And a couple of weeks later, I see a new employee. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's my mind going to the extreme when I was a kid. Like, yeah. oh, it's because I'm this. I'm because I'm this. Um, one thing, like when I applied for government jobs uh, before where I currently work, I always hesitate filling in that box of, do you identify as a minority? Or Because back in the days um, when I did it, they didn't have a other or like a half black, half white, or multiracial. Mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. had either black or something like that. But I'm like, I'm not fully black. I'm not fully white. Right. So, so I didn't know how to fill, uh, fill it out. But I think nowadays they have one that says, with one parent being a visible minority. And uh, yeah, I don't know how to fill out sometimes. My dad, so my dad works for the government. He's black. And he told me that sometimes he fills it out. Sometimes he doesn't fill it out. Just because he switches every now and then, he just switches it. So a lot of my inspiration of how I see race comes a lot from my dad. Cause my dad grew up in Canada. Uh, he was born here, but he lived the first six years of his life in Barbados. And, uh, he went to a lot of white schools and he was at the black kid in those white schools. And, uh, his, my grandmother's religious. And during the church, uh, ceremonies, uh, let's say uh, the little drummer boy, he would always be either the wise men or the drummer boy. He didn't, he couldn't play anything else. Mm. So he, my dad helped me out teaching me more about ethnicity and race and going through that. And it really opened up my eyes on how I should come at it. I shouldn't be angry because there's going to be people who are going to judge. So there's, it's a waste of energy to do it. My grandmother went through the same thing. My mother has taught me some things too. My mother is more of like the personality, focus on your personality aspect. And that's what really helped me be the person I am today. Interesting. Um, How do you like, there's people on who are kind of making a career out of going against again that 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 narrative that's kind of being pushed by the majority. So, have you heard of uh, his name Zuby on Twitter? I have um, not. He's like a he he's a he's a rapper from the UK. Um, he has a podcast. He has an audio book. All this stuff. He got big on um, Twitter because he posted a video basically saying that he's breaking the woman's uh powerlifting record uh but oh, i okay. only during this record i'm identifying as a woman kind of poking i think i saw that yeah, yeah. Po- poking you know um his nose in, in that debate which i won't get into but so that's how he kind of got big but now he, he's kind of like He's gotten big because he's very political in a, in a sense that he goes against the... The grain? Yeah, like <laughs> when you hear, you know, from voices that are, are talking about systematic racism and, and oppression and all those types of things, he goes against that and says, no, like, there, there's none of that or it's not real. People just want to be victims. Excuse me. There's also, you know, he says he would support Trump, all that stuff. Um, there's Candace Owens. Are you, are you familiar with... Um, so she's... Uh, 
you know, um, I think she's the leader of like the young black people for Trump or something. I can't remember what the, the organization is, but basically she's become a female commentator on politics and policy, uh, being like a young black woman who, who supports Trump. So again, going against that narrative that Trump's racist and, and, and kind of against what people are, are saying about the communities, like, and what they end up happening is that they become set, they, they, they get called sellouts or they, that, you know, like that type of thing that they're, they're selling out the community and, and, and all that type of stuff. Like, I guess that goes to our conversation of, you know, you can vote either way, what you want and judging yourself by, on your personality. But it's interesting that they get a big, they have a huge following because they think this way, but they also, a lot of people feel betrayed that they think that way. And that, that seems interesting that like you can't be a person of color or anything uh, other than like a white person and, and support Trump. So it's, uh, that's where the debate gets interesting as well, because there are Hispanics and, and people who do support Trump and his policies. And it's like, oh, well, know. apparently I'm a sellout because I can't speak Arabic. Yeah, that's right. I did. <laughs> so uh, yeah. at this point, I'm like, I'm a sellout to somebody. Yeah. So uh, I don't really care if people think oh, I'm a sellout because I have a lot. I have a lot of interests. It's like saying white people shouldn't be rappers or black people shouldn't uh, play hockey. Why mm-hmm, not? Mm-hmm. It's it's there. You learn about it. Why not? If you're interested, pick it up. And it's it, it baffles me that certain ethnicities have to be associated to one thing, and that's the only thing they can be associated with. Let's say we're going bo- based on like stereotypes. Like black people love watermelon. I love watermelon, but it's not because I'm black. It's just it's a very delicious fruit. Um, I uh, let's say uh, Asian before. people are good at math, or let's say white people are all good at hockey or skating. Is well, no, not all white people are good at hockey. Not all black people love watermelon. Not all Asians are good at math. You don't. It's 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 sad, really. Mm-hmm. That we live in a world that even though we have so much information about stuff, that we focus on like just because you're this. These are the standards. These are the things you must like to be considered this. If you're not this, because I'm sure you heard these terms, like some people, some black people are considered Oreos or some Asian people are considered bananas. In Uh, other words, Oreos are black on the outside, white on the inside. Right, right. Bananas, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Oh, I never heard the, okay, the Oreo one sounds right. I never heard of bananas. Yeah, I don't know if there if there should be one for white people, but I'm not exactly sure. We're uh, just, there's we're one Satan. for brown. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> see, see, that's the thing. Like theoretically, if if I thought I hated white people, then I would hate half my family. Yeah, <laughs> Which, right. But once again, it it goes down to also experience. Let's say I had relatively a good experience growing up from both sides of my family, the black side and the white side. But there could be some people who had experiences with. Let's say if you're a white kid and had bad experience with black people and a black kid who had bad experience with white people, there's a possibility that you may look at, at it, may look at it through a different lens. And it's it's unfortunate that you that person had to go through that. But there's some people who take it different ways. Some people take that lesson and try to make it better. And some people who take that lesson and try to, I wouldn't say get revenge, but bring the playing grounds equally in a bad way. Like if I'm going down, you're coming down with me kind of thing. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sad. That's, I can't be angry at this point because people will hate people no matter what we do. If, if, because mis- misunderstanding and miscommunication is such a big factor. I don't know if I'm going off right now, no, but no, no, I no. tend to go off on tangents and ramble. That's what this podcast is for. Yes. Okay, we don't great. have a structure. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I could be free. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do. I do strongly believe that in the future, People are going to understand each other more and more. And we, st- we are starting to see that, actually. Like, thanks to the internet, although there's a dark side, people are understanding more. There's people trying out new things, new cultures, visiting more, traveling. And there's immigrants everywhere, migration mm-hmm. everywhere. There's people, more interracial couples and understanding. And I do have hope for the future, but I also understand it's going to be a very, very slow process. It's going to be a bumpy road. Exactly. There's going to be a lot going on for it. Exactly. And if I am helping out right now by just saying, hey, we can all get along, just take the time to understand the other person. Talk to each other. You don't have to jump to conclusion. Sure, you may have had a bad experience, but not everybody is the same. It's like having a meal. 
sure you might have gotten food poisoning from one meal, but doesn't mean every other meal that's exactly like that, that you're going to mm. get food poisoning. Well, that's a very nuanced way of thinking. It's a shame not, not everyone has it, but you're right. It, it really, really comes down to experience, what you've experienced through your life, what your upbringing was, which shapes your view on the world. So, you know, if you were always put down by, you know, white people your whole entire life, experience, you know, racism, bullying, mm-hmm. harassment, not getting jo- like of course you're going to have a an awful lens on on, you know, society and and what the, what it's done to you. I totally get that. I while f- social media frustrates me, I also think it is a beautiful blessing in the yes. sense that like you said, you know, we're we're meeting people from around the world, we're experiencing cultures. But I do, I do really, really appreciate that it's given people a voice who's never had a voice before. I completely agree. So when you learn something like blackface, which in the time of when Trudeau did it, you know, was it right? No, but like at that time it was people still did it and it wasn't nece- necessarily considered wrong because we never heard from the voices that were to say that it was wrong, you know, right? We weren't listening. They didn't have the the megaphone to say, no, like, that's wrong. That's racist. We don't like it, right? So everyone just thought it was okay until social media came and then everyone started to be like, oh, no, like, now all of a sudden we're we're hearing all these different points of view and it seems like it's been a rapid, all of a sudden, like, oh, now this isn't okay. Now this isn't okay. And mm-hmm. people are like, wow, what's okay anymore? Yeah, and I get yeah. that because it has been fast, but not in the sense that it's been fast that people have been saying it. People have been saying it for years. I go and watch documentaries on the 60s, on the 50s, the 70s. The shit that is going on right now has been going on since that time. The only difference is now we're hearing about it because we can hear about it instantaneously without having to watch the news you know, or without having one-on-one conversations. Now we get to hear it in the, 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 the sphere that is social media, right? So it seems like to someone like me who's brought up in a little white town who had one black kid until I was in high school, of course I never would have heard any of this stuff because it was never being said in that town, but it's being said all around the world. So, you know, now that there's social media, it might seem like, oh my God, now what's okay anymore? Everything seems to not be okay. I don't get it. Where did this come from? We talked about that thing with social media and Trump and how everything seemed to accelerate. We're just, it's the transmission that's been accelerated, not what's actually been being said. People have been saying it for years. And that's what I appreciate about social media. Like now it gives me the opportunity to hear from these things and find out what's wrong and learn and listen. But you also need to listen on the other side. So one thing I'll say now is a big reason why I didn't support the NDP in this election, which I loved almost everything they were saying, because I knew in my heart working in a corporation, being a part of business and sales and transactions, that there is no way in hell that rich people are ever going to let them have to pay more money than the rest of us. They're just going to leave. They'll put their money in offshore bank accounts. They'll hire lawyers. They'll fight it. So I knew that their economic plan probably could have been, but probably wasn't going to be feasible. So I was like, like, I can't vote for that because if I, I could waste the vote and Sheer could get in that's the strategic voting that kind of came in. Yeah, yeah. But it's also a little bit of realism, understanding the other side that, yeah, I love everything NDP said. It sounded all great. But to me, it was a little bit of a fantasy world that we as a capitalist society aren't ready to embrace yet on a holistic level. So I couldn't support them with my vote because I, I just knew it, it wasn't a reality at this point. Exactly. And you you never know, maybe in the next election, they're going to change some things and you can change your vote. I'm not saying you have to vote for yeah. them, but I'm saying that's what, poli- uh, what is it? Not policies. Sorry. That's what, poli- poli- not policies, uh, parties. Thank you. That's yeah. the word I'm looking for. Yes. That is what parties do. They change things up and things that were acceptable, let's say a hundred years ago are probably not acceptable today. And that's, uh, it's all about change. That's what we do. We're humans. We change. Well, we, we learn adapt. and grow. You exactly. Know, if you if you're have not... <laughs> people doing that stuff now. Then you're like, okay, yeah, you're a piece of shit. You know, were they a piece of shit then? By today's standards, absolutely. You know, but mm. at the same time, it 
you know, that sometimes was a norm. We're going to look back in 40 years at things that are being done today. You know, one thing that you were saying about being multicultural, I remember not that long ago, we were talking about how one day there'll be so much, you know, um, interracial marriages yeah. that we're all eventually going to be one race. Oh, great. <laughs> you know, like whatever it is, like eventually everyone is going to like, it's a long time from now, but with evolution and, and all the different, you know, uh, people getting together from around the world, we're all going to be one skin tone race. It's all going to be blended. And I bet when they look back and all the fighting we're going to do, they're going to be like, I don't understand it. What was going on? Well, you want to hear an interesting thing I read a few, many years ago. So humans adapt to their environment. And that goes with your pigmentation, your hair, everything. I was reading a book about how a lot of Asians are descendants from Mongolia. And if you ever thought, why are Asians usually smaller? Genghis Khan. Gen- well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. But uh, no, like the, why a lot of Asians are sh- smaller is because Mongolia is usually a colder region. So having shorter body means your organs are closer together. So in order to keep warm. And that's why, not for everybody, but a lot have tighter skin. That's why the, the eyes are also like that because loose skin tends to freeze in oh, cold weather. Interesting. So... If you look at, uh, let's say, Africa, Africans usually are considered taller, right? That's so to spread out the organs. So because your body is trying to regulate to adapt to the environment. The darker skin is to protect yourself from the sun. So there's all these little things. I'm not saying this is 100% true, but this is what, for me, kind of made sense. I, If you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm always up to learn. But the idea that the human body adapts to their environment, it's like uh, blue eyes, are more sensitive sensitive to light compared to brown eyes and it all has to do with where you live and that's not just you personally but that throughout generations exactly. Yeah, exactly so that's, I, I love the fact that what's well, evolution exactly i love the fact that like humans you won't see it in your lifetime humans adapting unless we go turning into robots uh yeah i don't think i'm gonna be turning into a robot anytime soon but uh yeah it's just cool to think that we adapt to our environment throughout time yeah, uh, if you think about it on a smaller scale, if you were to pick up your life and move to a different country, say you were to pick up your life and you were going to move to Korea, mm-hmm. um, you would adapt your life to fit that culture, which would change you, which would also probably change future generations of you know your lineage. Mm-hmm. But it's just a small example that something as simple, like you would pick up, move to a different country – which would change, you know, maybe not your physical But your DNA, like your DNA, let's say you're eating a certain type of food, that can exactly. change your metabolism so, and stuff like you, that. The human body is like just mm-hmm. who we are as humans. Like we're just so adapt to, to change. And they always say it's one of the best things you can do in your life is go to a place you wouldn't, you don't know anybody, you don't know anything, you don't, you just go and you learn so much about who you are and, and yourself and how to live and, um, that they that's often a recommended advice if people are looking to find themselves like go move to a different country all alone that's what my wife did yeah and you're gonna <laughs> you'll you'll figure out yourself pretty quick pretty quick because yeah it's sink or swim and you, you're gonna try your best to swim so and we're yeah we're humans we want to survive that's our survival in- instinct yeah it's it's uh it's very interesting um like, I'm curious, I want to learn more about how different ethnicities, how they got their attributes, their looks, their, why some have bigger hands or ears being bigger or stuff like that. Just, I don't know, just to adapt to the environment. I've also heard that a lot of humans throughout our time, we're losing our basic instincts because we're sheltering ourselves in houses and adapting to the more comfortable life. But that's another aspect of human life. We don't try to make our lives harder than it is. Yeah. We try to find an easy solution to make our life more efficient simpler and easier to live there's an argument to be made that we are Mm -hmm. you know we're more depressed we're more anxious we're more focused on on privilege on you know oppression on on you know fairness all those things Mm -hmm. because now in life in gotta say this very carefully but in retrospect to (laughs) the rest of history humans have never had it better or easier again to qualify that is not saying people do not struggle and there is not 
awful things that happen. We all get that. But where we are now to where we were, 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 100,000, whenever humans started, life is easier today than it ever was before. There is more possibilities and for resources and get help. You can, I can sit here and order breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> and not move a goddamn muscle. That's Except pretty easy. But what I'm saying is there's theories that we're, we're like this now mm -hmm. because we do not have to focus on living anymore, on, on survival, on will I make it tomorrow? Where is my next meal coming from? Am I going to get eaten by, you I'm know... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of carnivorous moose. Am I going to be attacked by the the tribe or the village next over? That is a, a theory that because we have it so easy now, we have time to sit there and focus on all these other things, mm -hmm. which in turn, you know, maybe maybe biologically we're not adept for that. You know, we're we're not supposed to be be doing that. We're not supposed to be sitting at a desk all day worrying about you know what what money or that someone said something crappy on social media did you i don't know on that note did you know we're all pooping the wrong way you have to i like heard that you, <laughs> you have, to, have lift to, like your, yeah, exactly. yeah, you lift your knees but so yeah back to like the survive the whole aspect of like we have it easier i studied international development and globalization back in university so i focused a lot on third world countries and developing countries and some have it a lot harder than we do and one common thing that every single human has is their survival instinct you want to survive. You will try to do whatever it takes to find a better life. And what unfortunately in our day and age too is that fear is such a good, not a good, sorry, such a big manipulator, such a big controller. Whether it's family, friends, politics, uh, the media, anything to implement fear because fear controls. Mm -hmm. So saying, oh, fear of migrants are going to come take your jobs. I'm like, well, there's been studies done that immigrants don't try to make trouble because they're trying to stay within that country. I, I couldn't quote exactly which studies exactly, but like my family's composed of immigrants mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the, the only trouble my wife is, is when I do something stupid. So uh, my wife's an immigrant, my brother-in-law is an immigrant, my grandparents are immigrants. Uh, I have a, a friends that are immigrants and none of them are bad. They don't try to look for trouble and they try to look for the best life. Even if they had tough situations, they try to work around it. And that's why I think fear is a dangerous thing. I, once again, I'm doing horrible segues. I'm just like, whoop, just wandering There's off. There's no segues. <laughs> we just talk. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in, in North America, in Europe, and in, in other certain places in the world, we do have very good for the, some people. Some people have it hard around here. And uh, I think it's our duty as humans to help each other out because humans are, quote unquote, tribal communal people or society we like to work as together that's why like in prisons they they're trying to step away from isolation because the impact it can have on the mental health yeah we're social beings we're extremely social yeah. whether it's even if you're with somebody you disagree with that interaction what was that movie with uh, tom hanks he started making friends with a coconut or was it a volleyball Oh, yeah, Castaway. Castaway. Like, Wilson. Yes, Volleyball. Wilson, exactly, yes. The idea that you want, you desire that social interaction is a common thing for most humans, whether if it's with 100 people or just one person. Well, it's a, it's a foundation of well-being. So not only do you, you need food, you need water, you need exercise, you need... You do? Yeah, you do. Damn it. Physical... <laughs> yeah. It's not when I say exercise. It's oh, no, not, I meant water. Yeah. Oh, water, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> exercise, not going, not necessarily going to the gym. It's yeah, yeah. moving, walking, uh, right? Like that's a foundation, but also being loved, friendship, that social connection. That's, that's huge. Um, like you said, like in isolation, like people become psychotic. They become senile because of what it does to them being all alone, trapped in a room. And it's always good to be there for somebody, whether you're communicating with them or not, just to be present there, just to know that you have somebody there with you if you're going through a hard time. So now we're we're leaning into the mental health aspect. Look at that. Look at that segue. Yeah, we know we know <laughs> all about that. Yeah, you guys are good. This podcast has been very helpful. I've shared it with so many people and Oh, really? thank you. Yeah, they they really love how you tackle these like intense situations in a respectful way and you have such wonderful guests. Shout out to all the guests that's been on so far. I couldn't name them all. I 
First of all, I'm horrible with names. Yeah, okay. so that's why before doing every podcast, I try to like repeat yeah, 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 the name yeah. so I don't screw it up. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, mental health again, it's a it's a big part of my life. It's not it's not everything, but um, that just mm-hmm. with my connections and and who I know within that sphere, like a lot of them are, are like me and they want to share their story to to help other people. So. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have some some great guests come on and, and share their experiences, you know, and some of them incredibly raw. You know, Michael Dixon um, talking about, you know, talking about right up to a, a suicide attempt. You know, that was, it was very huge. Um, you know, Sabrina LeMay, like it, her struggles going through, you know, being 90 pounds and, and trying to live in a car, working for a job. Like, it's... Uh, this this podcast didn't set out to be just about mental health. It 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 just really I just want to. It's about people like you. I just want to. <laughs> I just want to connect with people. Everyone has thoughts. Everyone has opinions. Everyone has stories. Everyone has passions, and you know, part of this is for my mental health, just to to learn and talk to people and and just have a good time. It's that social connection. It's it's but also just just talking about interesting things that I'm interested in talking about. It's, yeah. It's a big thing, you know. I like talking about politics, and I, I like talking about race. It's a very touchy subject that you everything's have, touchy these that days. you have to <laughs> tiptoe around. But I'm, I just am very curious in learning all about everyone's point of view and their perspectives and their hmm. thoughts on it. And you know, like it's just to me, it's interesting. It's fascinating. It's you know, okay, why do you think this way? It's why do you think this is racist? Why do you not think it? Why do you subscribe to this I, like ideology or theory? And to me, that like that, I just find a big fascination fascination in it. Um, it just so you know, just talking about stuff with people, it helps get stuff off my mind. It helps me from being on social media too much and tweeting about it or putting it on Instagram. Right? It kind of kind of like cleanses the mind of thoughts and things that have been on my mind that day and you know it, it, yeah, I, I completely get where you're coming yeah. from like it's the same thing for me when somebody comes in talking about their hobby i'm all for it because i get to learn and i don't get to talk so they, they get to share their passion and i get to react what i tend to do is like you like a little bit i do prepare some questions so i don't go off track yeah but the reason why i prepare some questions because i try to find common ground between my episodes so people can understand like how did you get introduced to this hobby? So if you go from episode seven to episode 54, you'll understand, okay, this is how they got introduced to it. Mm-hmm. What are some misconceptions? So like, oh, well, the misconception from episode 27 is kind of similar to the misconception of episode uh, 47. So the idea, I want to try to link the episodes together, not necessarily by the hobbies, but by the people behind the hobbies. Mm-hmm. So people can understand the connection. So let's say, uh, what was your biggest challenge? People can have similar challenges. Um, what's your social media link that has nothing to do with common ground but it's the idea that everybody's unique but same at the same time it's like uh what's that movie with uh james franco and uh seth rogan where they go to north korea same same but yeah. different yeah. but still same that's that's the idea and uh like you i like to unwind and i don't prepare all the questions i have some questions set and then during the conversation um <clears throat> If they answer something and I'm like, oh, I really want to ask a question about that, I ask it because I'm really curious. And I don't look at their answers beforehand like you. This is all improv right mm-hmm. now. You're you're more courageous than me when it comes to the conversation. Anything goes. You're raw, uncut. I like edit some stuff. So like the voices and stuff like that, I, I don't edit like the conversation mm-hmm. itself. More is me just uh, – because sometimes I take pauses or because of technical issues or cars driving by. That's why I edit. But uh, yeah, yeah. you have a pretty good studio where <laughs> I don't think any cars are coming by. So you're good. Yeah, but- it's all blocked off. No, it, I mean, there's a million different ways to do a podcast. Um, what I wanted to do was just like it just, you know, two friends sitting over a beer or a coffee, whatever. Just just like talking and you're sitting at the next table just listening to it. And I hope you learn something or it's interesting or you find something you agree with or you disagree with. Um, for you, I I definitely see why the questions make sense because you're also having people probably not really accustomed to doing podcasts. Exactly. Or, you know, they're coming on – like people who come on mine like pretty much know from the get-go like we're just going to talk. And yep. if you're not cool with that, you're probably not coming on the podcast. You, I'm not cool with that after what yeah, an hour. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I'm cool. Yeah, you you know you're gonna have someone on who might not want to do 
who might be really nervous, like, or might really be like, you, there's a specific reason they're coming on. Whereas mine's mm-hmm. a little more open. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm courageous. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's just <laughs> talking again. I just treat it like a conversation. Like we're just okay. We're sitting here for an hour and a half. Let's kill some time. You know, what's the weather like today? Is it five degrees? Oh, geez. And it's just <laughs> just talk about stuff. That's. That's all it really is. You know what? To be honest with you, every time before I start a podcast episode or go into an interview or do a presentation, I'm a little bit nervous. And then when the moment I start the presentation or the conversation like on podcasts, my mind goes into autopilot <laughs> in the sense where it kind of goes blank and I just go with the flow. And then after the conversation, I reflect. I'm like, what did I talk about? What, what was that? What was that? I remember during one presentation. Back in university, I had a professor who would walk around the class smacking his desk, like the desk around like this. I'm not going to do it here, but this is how da 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 da. I'm like, okay, he's intense. So during my presentation, um, I started using my hands a lot. I started using the chalkboard, drawing circles. And then I went around the desk. This is da 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 da. And at the end of the presentation, he's like, that was good. I'm like, yep. Yep, yeah, that was definitely planned. That's a that's a good way to do it, though. You captivate. <laughs> I used to start them with like "Eye of the Tiger," so get people oh, in, like a little, a little intro, just to <laughs> helps like soften the mood, and you know, yeah, like yeah. especially like again with this podcast, like an easy thing to start the podcast is is like, okay, mm-hmm. what do you do? Tell me about it, and then like it immediately breaks any nerves, and they just start they just start talking about what they're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. You're just telling me what you do for a living, what you you're passionate about. You know, and it, it immediately breaks any nerves because you're just you're comfortable in talking about it, and then you can start branching off into steering other conversations. Now, before I didn't do it with you today because <gasps> you're a fellow podcaster. I'm just like, do whatever. It. If you need to do it, do it. I'm yeah. ready. No, what I do is like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, what are some things you want to hit? Like, what are some passions, some opinions, mm. some things you really want to talk about? I don't send them in advance. I'll just jot them down here. Yeah, yeah. and I'll say that. I'm like, okay, so there's that. And what do you not want to talk about? What are some areas you, you mm-hmm. just don't want to, you're not comfortable talking about, you just don't want to get into because of, you know, like we said, sensitive subjects, anything like that. Uh, and then I won't go there. And then that, yeah. uh, you know, makes them more comfortable with me being like, that that I'm not going to, again, it's not an interview. <laughs> I'm not some journalist it's a like, conversation. trying to trap you and be like, catch you on a, on a lie. And well, you're tra- like, not trying to trap me in these four yeah, walls. I'm, you know, like that gotcha. <laughs> that, aha. Oh God. I knew you said that thing. And, Damn it. I said it. Right. And then I, it goes viral because you said this thing that I caught you on. It's just, Jeez, I, don't, I don't care about that shit. You know, like, you know, like yeah. a, and, and trying to catch a, a politician to say something you want them to say. And they, they keep dodging the question. Like, no one gives a shit about that because you yeah. just you're gonna get the cookie cutter answer. You know, I, there's no interest in that. If you're not willing to talk and and have a conversation about shit, like I'm not interested in talking to you because it's not gonna be engaging. That, you, that's my philosophy about it. And you know what? Even if you're very careful on what you say, people can modify audio clips to make you sound incriminating or saying something bad. It's like right now there's a whole thing about deep fake. Have you ever heard about that? Where they yes. like superimpose yeah, yeah, yeah. a fake a face on yeah, somebody else's face, scary. and then they can put you in a criminal situation or make you pretend to say something bad. They do this for the voice. So basically, even if you don't say anything or you don't even show up on social media or anything like that, somebody it can matter now can do anything they want and put you in trouble. Well, like, you th- I actually got my identity stolen recently. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Oh no! What so happened? So I was part I'm um, part with Desjardins, my bank. Okay. And they had a scandal back in August where right, one right. employee released the information, or now it's a few employees. They released the information of 2.5 million people. And you were part of that. I was part of that. My mother was as well. But I was the only one who actually had their identity stolen. And oh my god! Okay. So they opened up a credit card with Walmart in the amount of eight thousand dollars, and they had a f- fake driver's license. It was a whole hassle trying to get that solved, but I was able to get more information out of Walmart than Equifax was. Like Equifax was like very slow on trying to deal with everything, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh well, it's just a dispute." I'm like, "No, no, somebody stole my identity. I did not open up a credit card at Walmart for eight thousand dollars." So I called uh, the Walmart bank and they gave me more information than they should. And the dude or girl or dudette, depending on how you want to use it, who created this fake account used a fake driver's license. And the last two numbers on the driver's license are 52. Now, just to be clear, in Ontario, 
for a driver's license, the last two numbers are your birth date. Yeah. So it can either yeah. be zero one to thirty one. I don't know who is born on the fifty second date of the the month. <laughs> so wow. Did you have to go through the police and everything like that too? I went through the police, contacted my banks, I went through TransUnion, and then I went through the credit union. So I think it is resolved now. It's oh. off my uh, credit, but yeah, there was two months to try to resolve it, and it was just back and forth. And yeah, oh, that's stressful. But uh, yeah, if you ever do get your identity stolen, first step is how'd contact. You, how'd you? Sorry, how'd you find <laughs> out? How did I find out? So. Um, after the whole Desjardins thing, they did a whole five-year plan with Equifax for free. So I got an email from Equifax saying, there's a new account that's been opened. So I look at it, and I look at the account, and it said, Walmart, $8,000. Okay. Well, no, it wasn't called Walmart. It was called Dual Bank, which is owned by Walmart, or Dual Bank owns Walmart. And so that's how I figured out. And I was really on it. I wrote everything down, and I think it's resolved. So I have to check on that, Damn but bro. yeah, oh, crazy. it's no fun. But basically now my SIN number is out there. So for life, and that's something I want. I, that's another topic I'd love to talk about where our banking system and security is horrible. No oh, shit. SIN number. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> like, think about it. Like our SIN number is just nine numbers. And once somebody has it, they can, ha- they can share with anybody in the world and you're screwed. Mm-hmm. Like somebody can use it and just make a fraudulent account, buy a house, buy a car and do anything they can and then screw you over. And it can take months, even years to get resolved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doom and gloom. Yeah. Um, so sorry, before I cut you off, you're going to say the first thing you do is with your identity stolen. Oh, yes. First thing you do when your identity stolen is to contact your bank to make sure everything is okay. Then contact Equifax and TransUnion. This is for Canada. For the American listeners, I believe they have Equifax and TransUnion there as well. Uh, So yeah, contact them. Give as much information as possible. Write down everything, who you spoke to, what time, uh, if they have a badge number. or, And also file out a police report. Do not not file one. Um, I think there's also a credit union. Um, Just make sure and don't be shy to get updates call in for updates to make sure everything is okay and after that it could take a while like it can take weeks it could take months in some cases it can take years but yeah those are the steps you need to take you can get all the information online i think uh the police in your area like they have a website that will Mm -hmm, teach you mm -hmm. what are the necessary steps to take i feel like this is an educational podcast now on how to protect yourself from stolen identity you learn learn (laughs) something new every time you listen yeah um okay have you learned anything about better protect like there's nothing you could do about this someone just (laughs) leaked it yeah there's nothing i can do so what's there to do now like do they give you like basically they're just like always monitor your credit because someone could take it now basically so equifax has a plan for five years because of the whole thing so they're going to monitor my credit and they also have a program where if a new account is open before it's open they contact me confirming that i've opened this account by my phone number and stuff like that and just mm-hmm. confirm my identity transunion has done it as well and i think desjardins the case popular for people who are in quebec um has done a agreement with transunion canada or TransUnion, that you're protected, your credit's protected for life. Okay. So you're constantly protected, and if you open up a new account, they will contact you just to make sure that this is you, and you can even freeze your accounts. So no new account can be created. So basically, if you're not with Desjardins and you get your identity (laughs) stolen, you're pretty fucked. I know some people who've opened up, like, accounts with uh, Equifax, but, like, like even Equifax had a data breach. Yeah. And was it Capital One had a data breach a few a yeah. month or two ago of a hundred million people? Yeah. <laughs> so basically at the end of the day, you're screwed. Well think <laughs> it. every thing that makes our society run mm-hmm. is all digital just waiting. Mm-hmm. All the data yep. that you know, banks, social media, credit cards google like all that shit that they have on us Mm -hmm. our search histories our sins our habits our like all of that is on this invisible thing in in 
Like even if you want it or don't want it. Yeah. Like it's and, just all there <laughs> for someone just it's just waiting. Like that just shows you how vulnerable we are. And to add extra protection, it's not a guarantee, but I would say don't if you're let's say you're in a coffee shop or in a hotel or anywhere that is using public Wi Fi, don't do any like banking on your phone. I have heard that, yeah. And if also to add extra protection, get a VPN. For people who don't know what a VPN is, it is a virtual protected network. So in other words, let's say Ryan is here in Ottawa, and if he uses a VPN, he can pretend that he is in London, for example. So it protects him a little bit more, protecting his identity or stealing information, and also get a antivirus. Mm. Like, I I had an, I have an antivirus. Even antiviruses aren't exactly 100% safe. Because I got a virus a couple days ago. I can't remember what it was called exactly. But it was a virus that removes your antivirus and then uses your computer for mining. By mining, I mean mining bitcoins. Christ. <laughs> so, Those yeah. hackers are crafty. Oh, yeah. And then the invention of quantum computers. So basically, quantum computers are something that we can't get in the market. But mm-hmm. for, let's say, a supercomputer, it can take thousands and thousands of years to solve a code or like solve a password and stuff like that. A quantum computer could solve it with mere minutes. Good. So, yeah, you have to live, if you're using technology, you have to live in the idea that you're already screwed. So I should stop using 12345 as my password. Or, you know what, you should start using password one. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> no one. And then no use it for everything. That. And then put a, st- a post-it note on your computer, on your work computer, so you don't forget. Yeah, that's right, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to do a whole bunch of cybersecurity stuff now at, at through like my job and mm-hmm. it's quite extensive and no one takes it seriously but yeah it, it's a good point that <laughs> shit can happen and you, and it you does try, happen it's a cat it's and not mouse, just a movie it's a cat and mouse game where once the hacker figured out something then the uh, podcast not the podcaster the uh the other hacker for the good guys figured another thing and even ends up being they hire a hacker to work for them good yeah. Good. Well, on that note, <laughs> that happy note. Yeah. Uh, time for your hobby yes. podcast. You're available on all podcast uh, platforms. Platforms. Yeah, yeah. Streaming, Apple, iTunes, all that stuff. iTunes doesn't exist really anymore. Yeah, but. Apple Podcasts. And now you can even learn more about Ryan and I on Pod Chaser. Yeah, that was a new thing we just you sent through that I started playing around with. Yeah, you get to learn about us as individuals and also which podcast episodes we were guest on. So I'm going to, once this episode comes out, I'm going to just link myself to that episode. Yeah, that's right. Eh? And then uh, Ryan has linked his, himself to the episode he appeared on on my podcast. Podchaser.com. Yeah. Um, where can they find you on social? Oh, uh, yes. Me for social media. Twitter. I am on Twitter for T. YFH podcast, so time for your hobby podcast. Instagram, it's time for your hobby. And Podchaser, I guess, is considered social now. Um, that's pretty much website. It. Oh, yes, my website. Uh, <laughs> Google but, it, probably, eh? Yeah, Google it. Like, I think it's on Wix. It's just like a main website that links you to everything else. And I have a Patreon, just if you do like to support. Ballsy, like Yeah, it. ballsy, exactly. You don't Does need it work to. For you? No, not, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. They're like, well, you're doing it for free after a year, Alex. Why am I paying you now? Like, you know what? That's a fair point. So if you want to support, cool. If you don't want to support, that's cool too. It's not going to stop me. But yeah, so Twitter, Instagram, uh, Patreon, Podchaser, my home address, my phone number. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yes, oh. Apparently you said number. <laughs> my, yeah, my SIN number. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's all there. Uh Alex, sexiest voice in podcasting. Thank I'll you. tell you that. Time for your hobby podcast. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me, man. I had such a great time. Bye, everybody. Stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes.